65 Board of Education special town hall meeting for Thursday, October 5th, 2023. Because we have three or more board members present for this town hall, we must officially call the meetings to order in compliance with the Illinois Open Meetings Act. Therefore, I'd like to call this meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. Carrie, we have a roll call, please. Present. So we can begin. Uh, and as a reminder, we are live streaming and recording tonight's town hall meeting in its entirety. So it will be available for people who could not be in the room. Now, would you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hall. I'm the Executive Director of the Office of 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 the Executive just in the interest of time, read that myself. Um, District 65 provides mission statement to ensure academic achievement and personal growth for all students through innovative and engaging educational opportunities. We envision an inclusive community of motivated learners who are inspired to change the world through exploration and collaboration. Our motto is excellence in education, enthusiasm for life, every student, every day. Many thanks to many of you in the room who helped to author that together as part of the collaborative process. So um, before I turn over to Dr. Leally, just the flow for the evening, we're going to, uh, Dr. Leally is going to present to us for some time. We're going to have an opportunity for open, uh, open Q&A as well as public comments to do at every open meeting. Um, so if you have a comment, you will have an opportunity to do that uh, during that session. Um, and it is my honor to move on to the next portion of our agenda and invite our superintendent, Dr. Leally, who led us through this process. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so happy to see everyone here tonight. I appreciate you joining us. And I am actually going to start by uh, just expressing such tremendous gratitude for the people whose names are on the screen. If your name is up there and you're in the room, could you raise your hand? Because we actually have a lot of strategic plan members here in the room today, which is amazing. Students, keep your hands up. These guys were amazing. The names on the screen are staff members, administrators, community members, with and without students in our system. Um, we have, and especially we have students, sixth and seventh graders, because we really wanted them to be here for the first year at least of our implementation plan. So I thank you for coming back. And also on the screen is Catalyst for Educational Change and Crystal Conley, who helped us through the process as well. That was the organization that kind of guided us and facilitated our work. I really wanted to highlight our process because, um, see, can you hear me if I'm not in front of the, can yeah. you still hear me for the video? Okay. Um, our process, which CEC has done with lots of different districts, we actually asked to customize a little bit because the board was really interested in making sure that we had as many possible opportunities for the community to give input. So our, the retreat, the strategic plan team and the way we organize our work with the, that big team is pretty much how CEC typically runs that process. So we had a, a very short, I think it was two hour introductory strategic plan meeting the first time um, to get an overview of the process and to meet each other and learn about what was gonna happen. And then we had three retreats that we held over at Gordon and they were each focused on different aspects of building the plan. So the first retreat was entirely data, which we'll talk about a little bit. The next retreat was visioning, and we had some opportunities in between there to get feedback from the community. Setting direction was when we really started to write the plan. And then the final meeting, we actually kept it together and drafted that plan. But our board had asked again for lots of opportunities. So in addition to that kind of regular or a kind of standard process, we added four special board meetings for Zoom so that the board could be updated along the way. And then each of those opportunities, um, there was a chance for the community to give input. We had six community forums over Zoom that were open to anyone. And just our facilitator was there to hear feedback. And then we also had three survey opportunities for the whole community. So we surveyed after our SWOT analysis, which was after the data, data retreat, we looked at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of the district. And then we asked the community to take a look at that. 
Um, and give us feedback if we missed anything or if there was anything they wanted to, to add to the list. After the visioning retreat, we sent out more information for the community to be surveyed about. We got more feedback on that. And each time, the strategic plan team looked at that data and really tried to incorporate the feedback that we were getting. And then finally, after the setting direction retreat, we actually released the entire draft plan to the community to get more feedback. And we did. We got a lot of feedback in the process. And I think it really helped us to build a plan that is inclusive of a lot of people's thoughts and desires and hopes for the district in the future. The other piece was we were asked to make sure it was really transparent. And so if you go to our website, even now, everything is still up, all the artifacts, the presentations, the data, um, videos from the board meetings, the draft plans, the surveys, they're still up on the website along with lots of pictures. And they're some of the most joyful pictures uh, in a strategic planning process that I've ever seen. So when in the beginning, when we started to look at data, a lot of the data that we were looking at were coming directly from our Illinois report card. So I want to take a minute um, just to take a look at, at these data and kind of explain some of those aspects. So these were data that were coming that we had publicly available at the time that we were designing the plan, which is really 21, 22 school year data. Because remember, we were designing this in the spring of last year. At that time, our middle school had a commendable rating and our elementary school had an exemplary rating. And again, those ratings are based on the Illinois Assessment of Readiness, which is the standardized assessment that's given to all students in the state. 857 was our enrollment, and you can see some demographic information, again, based on what was submitted that year. We had uh, an average class size of 19 and a teacher-student ratio of 14. The reason those two are different is that the class size is really just grade level and courses. So we're looking at the, the, the number of students in a classroom receiving instruction. When the state looks at the actual teacher student ratio, they incorporate other professionals, licensed teachers that support students. So that would be our related arts teachers, those would be other student services teachers, other people that might not have a classroom, but provide a lot of support to our students, which is why the ratio is always lower there. Uh, you have some information on numbers of students uh, receiving services through an IEP, 16%, 9% multilingual learners, which I think that percentage has gone up um, since then, 13% of uh, students coming from low-income housing, and students percentage that are, of students that are chronically absent, meaning missing more than 10% of school, is 13% of our students. The reason we pull out that data is because those are the data that the state looks at when they determine our report. We have some financial awards here. I wish Mr. Khan and his team would be able to make it today because they're tremendous. They're a tremendous asset to our district. They do a lot of work to make sure that we are fiscally responsible and transparent and that we're utilizing the resources that we get from taxpayers in, a, in a, uh, a responsible way and that we're allocating our resources appropriately. And then finally, up at the top, you'll see some indicators of our teachers. 77% have a master's degree. That's a really great thing, and it's something that we're really proud of, that we can hire teachers and support them to either obtain a master's degree after they're hired, or we can hire people already having a master's degree with years of experience, which not every district is able to do. And 100% of our teachers are rated proficient or excellent. There is a difference between proficiency and excellence, um, and we take that very seriously, that process. We follow the law. We implement observations based on the Danielson framework, which is a, a framework for professional educators um, that incorporates four domains of teaching, which is about planning, um, physical environment, and making sure that they're responding and knowing the needs of their students and demonstrating professionalism. And then finally in the middle, we have some metrics about measuring our success. And one of the things that I think this, uh, District 65 has been talking about for a long time is that the Illinois State, uh, the assessment for readiness, which used to be called PARC, which used to be called ISAT, that big standardized assessment is not the only measure that we use to determine whether or not our students are successful. We actually, for a long time, have had a large portfolio of assessments and a comprehensive plan to make sure that we give kids multiple opportunities to show whether they're growing or they've attained mastery and standards. One of those assessments is a local assessment called NWEA, or the math assessment. A lot of the kids talk about that. 
It's given to millions of students across the country each year. The reason it's a local assessment is because we made that decision to invest in it and spend the money to have the students take that assessment. And the reason we like it is because it gives us more information quicker and it gives us more information to make actionable decisions in instruction. It also gives us a measurement of proficiency and a measurement of growth between test administration windows. So we actually give it to students three times a year, right? Fall, winter, and spring. When we look at the end of the year from fall to spring, that assessment can tell us whether or not students have met their growth target for the year and whether or not they've attained the proficiency and standards for their grade level. When we were talking about this, we really decided that IAR gives us a measure of proficiency, but it's also given in March. And I don't know about you, but March is not when the school year is over for us. So we actually go all the way until June, which means there's a couple of months of instruction after they take the test. So that happens to every district around the state, but we thought, why not look at that fall to spring to see if any more students can show proficiency or at least show that they're, they've hit their growth target for the year. When we add those two together, the percentage of students who met their uh, met the expectations or exceeded the expectations for the state, we took them and then we looked at the kids who didn't, and then we tried to see if they made high growth on math. Those are the percentages of students that are demonstrating success or growth in one of those two assessments. In ELA, we're looking at almost 80%, and in math, again, almost 80%. Now, just because a student is growing doesn't mean they've achieved, achieved grade level standards yet, but it does mean they're progressing towards that. We really think that's an important measure of how a student is engaging with us and whether or not we're having value for them and moving them along towards that goal. So again, um, when we hit up, when we talk about our metrics later, we will be incorporating both of those metrics as well as hopefully two more. For our multilingual students, they take another assessment called the Access Test. The Access for ELLs is for students who speak a second language in their home. They take it every year, and it assesses them on reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Some of the assessment is given one-to-one, -one, some of that is given in a large group setting, and it takes a while uh, for that assessment to be given because there's so much to it. Our multilingual students, Hopefully, we can develop a way to measure whether or not they progress on that access test so that we can also give them some credit for moving along that continuum. And then finally, we have lots of students on an uh, individualized education plan. Those students receive specialized instruction and support. It doesn't mean that they can't learn, it just means they need different supports. And if they need different supports and are being monitored regularly in different ways, again, if they're hitting those benchmarks, that's what we want to see. They might not be ready to show proficiency or growth on the IAR, the math test, but they are showing proficiency and growth through their own individualized education. So we haven't incorporated those numbers yet. We're looking to see if there's ways that we can so that we can celebrate the growth uh, and proficiency of all of our students. We have a really amazing group of kids here that work really hard, and we want to make sure that we give them lots of opportunities to show us Looking at all those data, we also took a look at the portrait of the learner, which we, as you might recall, in the spring of 21, developed with Lake Forest District 67 and 115. The portrait of the learner is for all three districts, the North Star, and it's kind of above and beyond those standards, above and beyond the IAR and the math test. What do we really value and want our students to be able to do as they move forward in their lives? So all three of our districts now, after collaborating with I think we had over 100 people on that group. Um, and coming up with these six competencies, all three of our districts now are working on how can we measure these things. And I can tell you, uh, in the world of business and um, employers, these are the types of skills that they're really looking at. They're not looking at whether or not a student got A's. They're not looking at whether or not they met benchmarks on an assessment. When they come in for an interview, that's already assumed. What they're looking for are these types of things. And so what we're trying to do is build out that rubric and make sure that we have learning experiences in our instruction that offer opportunities for kids to move forward in those. So 
after all that, we got into a new mission and a new vision. And there was a lot of discussion that went into these and a lot of, of words that we decided we wanted in versus not in. But the really special thing was that that motto probably looks really familiar because that is experiment our vision. And I think the community really valued that uh, vision. And although it didn't give us a lot of direction, we still wanted to keep it in there, which is why now we have a motto, uh, which is excellence in education and enthusiasm for life every weekend. Our big landmark goals. So these are the big goals that are the focus of our plan. Goal one is about student achievement. And it was really about equipping students with whatever they need to show progress and to achieve their goals, but also maintain their well-being and develop their interests. So this is about a well-rounded program where students move forward, they achieve, and they're able to do more than just the academics. Goal two is about the learning environment that we have for our students each day. And that's about a safe, positive, rigorous, and engaging learning environment that meets all the needs of every student. So that one is about really culture and climate, how we're setting up our classrooms, what kind of instruction do we want, and that was really visioning for the best kind of school environment that we can think of for our students. Goal three is about community partnerships. We're so lucky here in Lake Club and Lake Forest to have a lot of community partners. We already have a range of organizations that work with us to support our, our kids, but we thought it was really important that we keep moving forward and developing those partnerships. So that one is about making sure that we're building trust and we're ensuring that those partnerships are getting more to enhance the education of all of our students. Staff and educator excellence is goal four which is about attracting, retaining, and developing the highest quality staff and leaders to make sure that each student is surrounded by a team of excellent educators. I love that language because all of our students do have a team and we work really hard to make sure that our adults are all excellent for them every single day. And then finally, goal five, which was a really big goal in the last strategic plan, is about aligning all of our resources to make sure that we have integrity and equity in our resource planning and all allocation so that we're doing what we need to do in finance and resources to align those things to meet the needs of the students whose needs maybe aren't met at this point. And making sure that we continue to be physically responsible and good students. So our metrics. This is a, a plan that goes out about five years. But we decided that our initial metrics would be a three-year goal for some, and then backing it into a one-year goal for some as well. So our, for our first goal for student achievement, we'd like to utilize that measure of success in, in integrating IAR and MAP, as well as access, hopefully we can get that one measured out by the end of this year, to increase from that 80% to 83%. So 83% of our students by the end of the year achieving or demonstrating growth or achievement on, in one of those three ways. For goals two and four, which again are learning environment and staff and educator excellence, we're going to be using the baseline culture and climate data that we have from our HumanX survey that we have been given to our staff for three years. Uh, and that indicator really shows us how many of our educators are feeling highly engaged and highly satisfied at work which if they are, is an indicator of better performance for everyone. So last year, we had 82.4% of our staff reporting high levels of engagement and satisfaction. We'd like to bump that up to 84. Just so everyone is um, aware of kind of a comparable, industry standard in education is 60%, highly engaged and satisfied. So we're starting off in a really, really good place. And we'd still like to continue to improve in that area. For goal four, we also are talking about student and parent engagement. Um, so we need to collect some data on that. So we have a new survey that's going to be going out to students on their engagement, and then also a new survey that will come out one time this year on parent engagement, how they're feeling about the school system. And then goal three, we're also working on kind of figuring out how we're going to engage parent participation in our community events. That might be for parents, that might be for communities. So we're working with our partners. Alliance and PTO and we're working as an admin team to figure out ways that we can actually collect a baseline of attendance or participation 
and then work to increase those ways. Because we know when parents and community are more engaged in schools, our students do better, right? And then finally, for goal five, for the next three years, we'll be working on building a system to look at our return on investment of resources. Um, and we'll be looking at the usage and satisfaction or efficacy data. That is a three-year goal because we don't have a system for that. So that could be anything from investments in facilities and furniture to investments in curricular resources or software or how our tech is being utilized. But we really want to make sure that what we spend money on, we're using and we're getting results from. But that's kind of a big long-term goal that we're working on. And then, like I said, we're currently working on developing assessment tools for the four children. <laughs> Another aspect that we really love about the work we did was that we came up with some core values uh, that guide our decision making as a system. And you can see up there um, some of the words and some of the concepts that we came up with. Specifically, kindness was something that was talked about at the board level about we really value just people being kind to each other, which is a pretty um, simple and nice core value to have. Um, for me, my favorite is joy. And when I did my dissertation in 2010, it was on joy for classrooms and the impact that that has on students' brains and their ability to learn. It's really, really important. But obviously, you can see other things up there like that ties into the work we've already been doing, equity, empathy for uh, social emotional learning. We've been working on empathy perseverance and resilience, having a growth mindset, and then of course, respect and responsibility, which we work on all the time. Another interesting aspect is the portrait of an adult, which is, we talked a lot about, does this just mean teachers? Does this mean anyone? We kind of settled on anyone that works with our students, we would love for them to embody these characteristics. And We've already embedded a lot of this into the language that we're using, and we're thinking of ways that we can uh, offer staff opportunities to thank each other for those things or document when they're seeing it so we can track how we're doing on this. And again, you can see some of the words. Um, one of my favorites here is creative, because as we were talking with our students about what kind of instruction we wanted, the kids were like, well, we like it when teachers are creative and do things different, right? It makes things more interesting. And obviously, trustworthy, uh, enthusiastic, clear communication, all the things that we would want. In a normal CEC strategic plan, they don't develop a classroom portrait. But our team was like, wait a minute, if we're doing all these other portraits, it might be important to outline what we want our classrooms to look like, which we thought was really exciting because this actually gives us a blueprint for what we want instruction to look like. Even when we're walking around as administrators, just kind of popping in and out of classrooms, it's nice to say that like, these are the things that our community wants. These are the things our students want. These are the things our staff wants. We want our classrooms to be all of these things. Um, and these are really great things to have in a classroom, right? And then finally, a portrait of our system. So when we're making decisions, aside from those core values, that we have some other attributes that we'll be thinking about when we make decisions or look at systems built into our district. So purposeful, adaptable, community-centered, um, informed was an interesting one, and that was an interesting word because I think what we were really getting at is we want our district to stay on top of best practices, to keep learning, to keep growing, to keep getting better. And that was about what was being informed and also informed on our students. So prior to the rollout of the strategic plan, we had already done some work on some of these things. Some of the big things that are highlighted in the communication document are about a multilingual support audit. It's no secret we've had achievement gaps in our district uh, for our groups of students. So for students living in poverty, students who speak multiple languages, students who have uh, IEPs. We definitely have had large achievement gaps. And so, specifically with a group of students where they're learning English, uh, we have already conducted an audit and we have added staff in those areas and looked at our scheduling to make sure that those students are receiving more support. Uh, and you know or may not know, we have a committee, which has been helpful in determining how our community feels about our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, what's already happening in our classrooms, and we're continuing with that work this year with some professional learning, 
the collaboration just around how our students are feeling and whether or not we're designing instruction that meets the needs of all of our students. Our middle school students created a unity club um, promoting inclusivity and shared experiences. They are an awesome group of kids that have already done a lot of activities. Uh, we've been working on a multi-tiered system of support, which is about interventions. When our students don't get what they need or are struggling um, to make the growth and progress, then we have a system where students get additional interventions and we're monitoring their progress. We've been looking at that. Um, our director of student services, who's got Fanny Tracy Rourke, who's also on our team, has been working to launch a birth to five connection. So we have bags that are put together that were grant funded, and we are connecting through the regional office of education with hospitals in the area to connect immediately with families whose students are going to be in our system so that we can offer them um, support, give them a connection to our district, and make them feel at home right away. So that if they do need support prior to coming to kindergarten, they know where to come. Because the, as you know, we have three and four-year-olds here as well. We have a new math interventionist at the elementary school, which we did not have before. And as you may or may not know, we've shifted our staffing plan around to make sure our class sizes are staying at optimal levels, anywhere uh, between 19 and 22, which is a pretty good class size. In many cases, it's lower than that. In some cases, it's a little higher than but we've been investing in that because we want a more individualized program for all of our students. So some of the action items to get us to reach those goals, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. For goal one under student achievement, we're writing a guaranteed viable transparent curriculum. What does that mean? We obviously have curricular resources that we've been using for some time, uh, but one of the highest impacts on student achievement is to be able to guarantee outcomes for students at every grade level. Not many people know that a textbook company actually writes a textbook with over two years of material inside of it because teachers need to make decisions based on what students need. Um, and then sometimes we get to things and sometimes we don't get to things. Sometimes teachers are feeling like there's too much to cover. So one of the most important things a school district can do is really develop those priority areas and ensure that we are guaranteeing some things for all students and then more for the students who are ready for it and interventions for the students who aren't there yet. And the reason guaranteed Bible curriculum is, is been out in education as a best practice for over 25 years. The reason we added the transparent part is because we really want our parents to be able to see it. So our units of instruction will be online. They'll be accessible for all of our parents to see. Uh, the scope and sequence, some of the core resources that we use because we want that partnership with parents. Our multilingual, oh, I'm sorry, supported by that robust system of tiered interventions and, and supports for students who, who need more than that guaranteed curriculum. Our multilingual department has invested again in additional staff, more time and, re time and resources, and a data system to help us analyze how our students are doing. As far as enrichment, we have an audit happening this year with the Center for Talent Development through Northwestern University. They helped us a while ago to design our enrichment program, um, but after the pandemic and our all of you know looking at our student achievement, looking at how our demographics have changed, looking at the needs of our students, we felt it was really important to actually partner with them again, look at all of our data, and design a system that's going to meet the needs of our students. <laughs> It doesn't mean that enrichment services has completely stopped. In fact, our classroom teachers worked with the Center for Talent Development for the last five years to get you know, support strategies and skills to utilize in their classroom. They continue to do that. But Northwestern is helping us take a look at the whole system and determine what staff and services are most appropriate for us right now. And as far as goals two and four, we're focused on building professional learning communities, which is about building in collaborative time for teachers to be able to look at student work, to be able to grade things together, to be able to calibrate expectations, um, to be more focused and data-driven. We've reinstituted Lake Bluff University, which is our teachers teaching each other. They design classes for each other, and then those choices are put into them uh, during faculty meetings so teachers can choose who they want to learn from, from their colleagues, in addition to whatever experts that bring as well. And then enhanced support for student and staff mental health, which we've been having a focus on since I arrived and even before that. We want to make sure that everyone feels um, safe and has the support that they need for their mental health care. 
Partnering with our community is our, our goal this year is to work on providing more support for our students who are coming from low income backgrounds. And where can we provide opportunities for those students to have a more well rounded experience, not just here, but also in the community? Because we know that makes a big difference when students can participate in sports or when they can participate in other community events that other kids are participating in, they do better in school. So we're reaching out for some help on that. And then finally, goal five. I, every, everyone knows that safety and security is top of mind for everyone. We've invested in a lot of already improvements um, for safety and security in both of our buildings, but we continue to look for ways that we can improve that as well uh, in the facilities and then also in our preparation. Our uh, board is discussing whether or not to have a shared director of state safety and security with another district. Many North Shore districts have been looking into that. That's something we're talking about. We partnered with um, organizations to run drills and simulations. We've run some different kinds of active for our faculty in the last year. So we just try to continue to, to improve in that area and prepare uh, in case we ever have that situation. Before I open up the, to um, questions or comments, I just wanted to include some of these pictures from this school year. Um, it is evident if you walk through our buildings, I hope it's evident when the kids go home. I know that there's some, you know, when you're like talking about homework and how your day went, sometimes you don't hear all the joyful things. But honestly, these two buildings are full of joy and kindness and support. And it's a pleasure to be here with the staff and students. This is an amazing community. It has been for a long time. So this plan isn't about starting over. This plan is about moving forward and making sure that we keep getting better. And we have a a tremendously solid foundation to start with. Uh, <laughs> I do give a lot of credit to people who've been here before, like Kathy O'Hara, who's been here for a long time and knows how excellent this place is. And we're just building on that tradition of us. You may or may not have heard we have an attendance campaign going on <laughs> because we want our kids here every day. We can have them here. So this is kind of a slogan that we've been using uh, because kids do better when they come to school with us. Um, but it's kind of become a little motto for this school year that you know every student every day is how we do things, and we're just really excited about the launch. With that, I'm happy to open it up to any questions or if the board wants to say anything. Maybe it's a good time. We'll have public comment officially at the end. Typically, in public comment, the board won't respond to questions by our board policy, but for QA, it's time to take these questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, any kind of some of you maybe some questions in advance, feel free to ask or anything else. Did we email the questions in? Are those? Yes. So, I tried to incorporate yeah. most of the questions. Tell them here. Yeah. Um, so, one was about the teacher student ratio and the class size. And I received one other question that I don't think I've answered yet about literacy. Um, there's been a lot of information in the news about Lucy Hawkins and teachers' college units of study. We did get a question in about whether or not we're continuing to use that program, and I can tell you we're evaluating it now. What I would say is, though, we moved three years ago to incorporate the science of reading prior to the pandemic. So our teachers were already incorporating it before all the hoopla came out about that program because they were noticing that kids were struggling in the areas of science and community awareness. The new part that we're talking about now that we're implementing this year is a structured curriculum-based assessment of AIMS Lab that really targets uh, phonics and phonemic awareness skills. So like nonsense word fluency or phonemic um, initial sound fluency, all the little discrete skills that are taught uh, explicitly through the science of reading. We're implementing regular progress monitoring for that and looking at whether or not this is a program that we want to keep or not. Anything else from the question? You hit on enrichment and the audit for that. Uh, you hit on security and mental health. Um, I think you broke down separating ELA and math um, as two separate measurements. So those are the questions that we had submitted, um, but happy to take any. That's easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I could say uh, on behalf of the board, uh, and feel free to jump in. Um, you know, we 
when the IAR came out, you know, our board from all the organizations really clear that we are have always been more innovative, more forward thinking here in Lake Plum. And so I just talk about this in here. And wanting to find a way to not just stick with one assessment that doesn't really give us credit for work we did. And I think uh, I know our board was really pleased. Um, the administration, I think, did a great job of finding a way to, to really comprehensively look using a variety of evidence based assessments to. Uh, to, to really give students credit. Uh, and then the, the SMART goals at our board wanted to see some SMART goals and some, and some baseline data and, and how we would measure that moving forward. Uh, so, you know, if you haven't had a chance to go back and watch some of those board meeting discussions, all that's on the internet, you know, we had some really good, robust discussions around those measurements, around the SMART goals, around how Dr. Layout and her team were looking at student achievement in a way that it's just never really done before in a more advanced way. So, any board members want to comment on succession? I just I think it's an innovative way of doing it that as you say, like hasn't been done before. Um and hasn't been thought of as far as achievement beyond the test scores. And for me at least, it really made a lot of sense because I could never really get my arms around the achievement and understanding how much I was doing by just having those test scores. So I I just think it's you found a great way to be able to dig in and get some real information. Yes. I do want to clarify one other point about IAR, um, because that is part of a federal accountability measure. Every state needs to have one of those. Things. They don't all use the same test, and they don't all use the same standards measured on the test, and they don't all use the same criteria to determine means or seats. In Illinois, it's a five-point scale. Student gets a one, two, three, four, five in ELA or measure. In Illinois, only a four or five counts for me meeting an ACB standard. So a four, if you were to equate it to a five-point scale, like an A, B, C, D, F, A would be that five, right? And those are the kids that are exceeding standards. They've got it. They're proficient. B would be that four, right? Illinois only counts those two. Many states count three as well as a meeting, in, a, a meeting of standards. And our state calls that approaching. So if you were to incorporate threes into Illinois scores, our scores would look a lot different. But what I think some people think is when they see that only a certain percentage are meeting or exceeding standards, like that only that percentage of students are literate or are growing or are achieving, it's just not true. Um, that is just the measure that Illinois has decided to use. And it's sort of a simple way to calculate it, but it doesn't really take into all into account all the variables, and especially in a very, very long test that takes a lot of stamina. Not all of our kids have that stamina, especially at third, fourth grade, for days on end, for hours on end, looking at a computer, scrolling through passages. I mean, if anyone's, I know people, <laughs> we've had people sound here, um, watching a student take a test like that can actually be pretty painful. Um, it can happen during math assessment too. Some kids really, really want to do a good job and they can sit there for multiple hours, sometimes multiple days. And if you've ever taken a test over multiple days or multiple hours, it doesn't matter how long you sit there thinking about that thing. Your brain capacity, right, goes down. But if you get tired, um, you might be anxious about that kind of assessment. And so giving kids a couple different ways to show they're growing is really important for everyone's mental health, including teachers. Because our staff, when they get those numbers, don't love it either. It doesn't feel good to see that low percentage of students and have watched them take it and struggle with it and not be able to do what we know they can do, and they just can't do it in that platform or on that day based on whatever circumstance is happening for them. So again, our goal is to really make sure that we're supporting everyone, that we're highlighting that good work, and we're keeping everybody motivated to move forward and keep progressing. But make no mistake, that bar of IAR is our first bar. We want all of our kids to pass that assessment. That's the goal. Um, this measurement is just a way to show that our kids are doing a lot of great things. And even the ones that haven't passed there are moving forward. Any other questions or comments? I, I think we covered this at a board meeting, but could you kind of go into how you plan to, uh, sorry, um, show the community how we're meeting or 
how we're doing with regards to these goals. Yeah, so we have tried a couple of things to start with. Um, in our board meetings, all of our agenda items now are attached to a strategic plan goal, so we really try to stay focused on what we're working on um, and highlight that for the community. We'll be doing periodic um, community you know, board reports on these goals. Um, and part of what we need to do is develop a forward-facing dashboard for our community to be able to monitor how we're doing on all these different things. Um, the dashboard, because some of these measures don't come in that often, probably will be static in some areas uh, for a year uh, because of these metrics only come in once a year, but some of the aspects might not. Um, and so that's part of our development now, along with our new website, which is a little bit um, behind where we wanted it to be, but Kevin's been like on it and working really hard. Having just started in July, um, it's already on a much better path. So um, we're really trying to work on developing that forward-facing internal data dashboard so that our community can go on and to blow it. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, well, so any other board member comments? Okay, well, just to make it official, I will move on to the public comments, even though we've had QA. Sorry, you got a chance to ask. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we just had QA, and I had a chance that you wanted to uh, say that the board of education needed to offer options for public comments. So if you'd like to make a public comment, you can go in and type yourself in the not seeing anybody rising. So, I have a motion to the very end of the special town meeting at 1637. All in favor? Okay. Any opposed? Okay. All right. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>